Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. My name is Marcus Gray Hauck. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I serve as the Director of Music Ministries for our congregation. And this morning I'm joined by our all-star band consisting of Dana Moore as our hymn leader, Mike Gilch on piano, and Glenn Rombo on the guitar. Oh, and Reverend Scott is at the drum set. <laughs> While he's also running sound up in the booth. I'm not quite sure how he does that. He's an amazingly talented man. All right, we're going to start with Come, Come, Whoever You Are, a hymn of the month. But there's a new part, and it's not really new. It's been part of the hymn all along, but we haven't been singing it. It's not in the hymnal, but it is part of the composition, and it's part of the poem that Rumi, the 13th century Sufi mystic, has written that this hymn is based on. And the line is, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Uh, the, the extra line is, Though you've broken your vows a thousand times. Come, come, whoever you are. Though you've broken your vows a thousand times, 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 come, come. 
And you're already doing the thing which I forgot to ask you to do, which is that according to the new guidelines, we're not supposed to sing as a congregation anymore. You can hum along and all that, but indoors because of the Delta variant, uh, we've been asked not to, uh, not to sing as a congregation. So thank you for following that, even without me telling you. Um, next we're gonna sing Faith of the Larger Liberty, a uh, 16th century tune from the Bohemian Brethren. Wherever you are, wherever you come from, whatever age, ability, history, identity, gender, or sexual orientation, you are welcome to bring your full self here. I am Ginny Crooks. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Grounded in faith, we come together to nurture the soul, inspire hope, and bring into being a more just and loving world. Today's service, called People's Choice, is our annual question box service. Questions have been submitted, and questions will be solicited from those joining us virtually and those joining us in person. What are your questions about Unitarian Universalism, faith, God, grief, goodness, theology, or more? Our senior co-ministers will do their best to answer. Write them down now or when they come to mind. Questions will be solicited during the offertory. We're so glad to gather together in person and with all those who are joining us virtually. We are a community knit together across time and space. Due to an uptick in COVID positive cases, we've decided to postpone our move to two services and our Welcome Fest weekends until October or November. Our services will remain at 10 a.m. Registration for attendance is required, though we will endeavor to make space for all of our guests. We are maintaining social distance and all are required to be masked and vaxxed. And as Marcus mentioned, beginning today, we have restricted congregational singing, asking that instead those present hum along while our hymn leaders sing. Yes, this may feel odd, but humming a song can be a spiritually powerful experience. 
Ours is a covenantal community. This means that while we do not share common beliefs, we share a common covenant, a commitment to come together in service of the beloved community. Let's light our chalice as we share our chalice lighting affirmation. Let us open our senses to take in the beauty. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Hello, I'm Reverend Anya Sandler Michael, she, her, hers, and I am joined today by Jenny Crooks, who is serving as our liturgist, and Reverend Scott, who is serving as my husband and senior <laughs> co minister. And we are going to share our time for all ages. This is called This is Maybe Yes, Maybe No, a traditional tale from China. Throughout, Ginny will be voicing the words of the farmer, which are the same throughout the whole story. We welcome you to join in by sharing them quietly under your masks. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe yes, maybe no. So here's our story. There's a story of a farmer whose horse ran away. That evening, the neighbors gathered to commiserate with him since this was such bad luck. Your farm will suffer. You cannot plow. Surely this is a terrible thing to have happened to you. But the farmer answered, Maybe yes, maybe no. The next day, the horse returned, but brought with it six wild horses, and the neighbors came to congratulate the farmer and exclaim at all of his good fortune. You are richer than you were before. Surely this, losing the horses, turned out to be a good thing after all. But the farmer answered, Maybe yes, maybe no. And then, the following day, his son tried to saddle and ride one of the wild horses, and he was thrown off and broke his leg. And he couldn't work. He couldn't work on the farm. Again, the neighbors came to offer their sympathy for the incident. There is now more work than you can possibly handle. You may be driven poor. Surely this is a terrible misfortune. But the old farmer said, Maybe yes. Maybe no. The day after that, the conscription officers came to the village to seize young men for the army. But because of his broken leg, the farmer's son was rejected. When the neighbors came again, they said, How fortunate things have all worked out for you. Most young men never return alive from these wars. Surely this is the best of all fortunes for you. And the farmer said, Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe yes, maybe no. The fact that we are here again, struggling with new COVID restrictions. Is this fortune? Is this good fortune? Is this bad fortune? What do you think? Maybe, maybe yes. yes. Maybe, Maybe no. no. Called to find depth in our days and reverence in this hour. We seek a gentle meditation, a focused reflection and ardent prayer, each as we are called yet mystically all together. And we enter into this space by hearing the lamentations, the requests and the remembrances of our community. Let us hear one another to heal one another. We light this first candle
for the family and friends of Albert Pelham, many of you may know him, knowing that this light also shines for our entire community of Montclair. We've all lost a powerful advocate for justice. Albert, a longtime NAACP leader and a friend to many here, to Reverend Anya and I specifically, always fought for a better world. He has now died in his legacy. However, we are bound to continue. Debbie Antropoldi writes to light this candle for Anne Rotunda, director of the Nutley Special Young Adults. For nearly 40 years, she lost her battle with acute myeloid leukemia, August 21st. She will be missed by everyone in town. We light this candle for the people of Afghanistan as they face an uncertain future and a perilous present. May forces of evil consume neither them nor their liberty. We light this candle for all who may be in the path of Hurricane Henry. Long Island and Connecticut seem to face the worst of this storm. We send them our prayers of safety. We light this candle for the family and friends of Stephen Wayne Murphy, longtime member of this congregation, whom we memorialized just yesterday. All present spoke of Stephen as a connector, as a real mensch, as one who brought people together across distances. Indeed, his was a, and is a powerful legacy. And the flowers for today's service are from Stephen's family, a gift from the memorial, and they speak of his beauty. And we light one last candle for all those movements of soul deeply felt, but left unspoken. And together, we hold a silence, a silence of reverence that also holds us. May our listening bring forth acts of love. Please breathe deeply but gently with me. Join me as we enter into a time of prayer. Spirit of life known in so many ways by so many names. The benevolence which brings all goodness into being. As we gather on this summer morning, here to be comfort one to another, we see the gray skies and feel the rain, and we're reminded that too many among us struggle for life and love, for health and wealth, for peace and solace. We gather to be with one another in hopes of having folks to share, share our pain and our joy, our triumph and our confusion, seeking answers to life's challenges and sorrows, knowing answers are sometimes elusive, maybe yes, maybe no. We notice once again our patience tested by one gathering storm of tropical weather and another of a pandemic raging once again. Around this room, around the corner, 
around the world, people are plagued by warfare, violence, environmental devastation, disease, loss, despair. We pray for the cessation of suffering, the ability to put suffering in context. And we, when we get consumed with woe and concern, we pray joy will find its way to us and to those we love. We pray that this free faith of ours will show us ways to regain perspective, to establish balance, to reawaken our love for life. So often it seems like just too much is going on. Like too many demand too much of us. But for all that is our life and all that comes calling, we pray that our hearts never become like walled gardens. Instead, we toil together to devote ourselves to that which courts diversity, protects innocence, offers blessing, confounds the wicked, and embodies love. We pray that we can climb to meet the potential of this day. And in that praying, we summon that all that each of us holds dear within says with us, Amen. Please join us now in our prayer response. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. is steep and rugged, isn't it? The road is steep and rugged. I'd like to invite you to write down your questions, if you have any, that you'd like us to try and address. 
any questions about Unitarian Universalism, God, religion, faith, grief, hope, any questions that are resting with you today. And when it comes time to collect the offering, we'll collect the questions. And that's coming next. So write them down if you have them for us. So we are climbing, we are climbing on, and we seek to share the blessings that we receive along the way. 80% of what you offer will care for our congregation, and 20% will support Isaiah House. Located in East Orange, Isaiah House reduces the occurrence of homelessness, hunger, and unemployment with residential and community programs. Shelter programs serve teenage, youth, disabled, single, women, men, adults, those living with HIV, AIDS, and more and more. Over 60% of the families served have successfully relocated to permanent housing. You can text to give. You can use, oh, we don't have the code up here, do we? <laughs> we had to skip doing the slides today. Rev Scott, do you remember what the code is for it's texting? 73256. 73256 is the code if you would like to text to make your donation, or of course, you can place your gift in the offering basket. Ushers, please come forward. Thank you, Michael, that was beautiful. All of your gifts are worthy and they are all received with love. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days and fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating saved from unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life.
would seem so strange it dishonors those who go before us so lift me up to the light of change yes I am open and I am willing for Wow, right? <laughs> so we're gonna do our question box sermon now. And I wanted to just quickly thank Peter Arian for collecting the questions that were received in the virtual chat and bringing them forward. If, uh, if you didn't get to get a question in virtually, I think Peter is still monitoring and you are welcome to do that now. Ginny is going to be reading the questions to us that have been collected. And Ginny, I think I saw a late question got dropped off right there and didn't get to you. Reverend Scott and I are going to start with some questions that were received throughout the week. And the first one is, what does it mean to be a Unitarian Universalist Christian? Can we still believe in the principles reject the concept of Trinity, and call ourselves Christian and Unitarian Universalist. And Reverend Scott is going to take this one. So yes, and yes. Uh, Unitarian Universalism comes from a couple of ancient ideas. Unitarianism, that the truth or the divine is essentially one, and Universalism that all are worthy of salvation and all have dignity. Institutionally and theologically, we, we stem out of the radical left wing of the Protestant Reformation as folks who were trying to keep the notion of revelation and insight alive in their theological seeking, in their worship, and comes out of that Christian fold. And though we became a non-credal faith, we rejected the notion that we have to all agree with one list of statements about what God is or God is not. We are squarely still open to Unitarian Universalist Christianity, Kathleen Rollins, William Wallace Fenn, Mino Savage, A. Pal Davies. Some of the best Christians that I've known and read are Unitarian Universalists. What does it feel like, Rev Scott, to have me looming over your shoulder? I'm used to it. Yes, I thought. <laughs> I was trying to think, am I the good angel or the bad if I'm there on the left <laughs> side? The next question we received, is there a realistic way for us to be involved in international justice issues? Something that I'm sure a pull a lot of us feel. I've been reflecting on this question and the word that I keep coming back to is the word involved. Involved. It means to be connected, a part of, within, moving as one with, involved. And it is so difficult to be involved from a distance. When we do justice work right, we do it with a community, involved in a community. And it's nearly impossible to do that from a distance. So sometimes the best we can do is support those whose work we respect, who are involved in a community, embedded a part of. 
I think I'm going to take the next question as well. This one, as Unitarian Universalists, we covenant to respect the inherent worth and dignity of each individual. What about other religions? Do we differentiate between religions that are traditionally our sources and religions like Scientology and Mormonism? And if so, why? The age? The origins? I've been reflecting on this question, and I see that there's a very big difference between our first principle and how we relate to other religions. The first principle is, as we covenant to respect the inherent worth and dignity of each individual. We covenant to see the inherent worth and dignity, potential, the potential in each person, the capacity they have to live out that inherent worth and dignity. However, we don't have the same sort of faith in every religious theory. So there are a lot of theories that I have, and some of them don't have any inherent worth or dignity. <laughs> Like, for example, when I see a sign on the side of the road that says ice cream, it means I need to go get some. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily have inherent worth and dignity, yet I still think that I do. <laughs> so there are different ways that we look at the theories, the dogmas that ground different faith traditions, and the way we look at the individuals that uphold those and try and live them in their lives. But I hope that we're able to see every individual as having potential and understand where their theories come from and sometimes even the beauty that they have embodying them. And Reverend Scott, this one is for you. Why does the Unitarian Universalist position on class include the middle class but ignore the concepts of working class or ruling class? Curious question. I'm, I don't, I'm not aware the Unitarian Universalism has a position um, on class that excludes the working class or ruling class. Um, it, in my own theology, I know that both Reverend Anya and I and guests we've had in this pulpit have spoken often about the needs of the poor, about the greed of some who have power and privilege, and about the need to have a system that's fair. In many ways, uh, sort of what you were just speaking about, Reverend Anya, that you know, we don't declare entire systems to have inherent worth and dignity or ideas or theories, um, but the notion of working class and ruling class are tools from a particular theory of understanding history, economic history, um, that's just one tool that helps us understand. But I know for certain, you know, I've spoken here, uh, spoken here at times about the need to find dignity in those who work. I'm, a, I'm an electrician, everything I do is working class. You know, I mean, I, I, I traipse around here in bib overalls full of dust and grease, um, fixing things, right? So, um, and, and additionally, we have, we've spoken at length at times about the prophets, right? You know, we, we hail, especially those first books of Isaiah in the, in the Hebrew tradition, the, the, the book of the prophets begins with Isaiah and that's intentional in, in my understanding and many scholars' understanding because that book lays out clearly what the prophetic project is for Judaism and for, I think, people of all faiths and certainly from our tradition. And what it lays out is that it's the duty of the nation to take care of the poor and the widow and the immigrant and the orphan. It's the duty of the nation to not start war where war is not needed. It's the duty for us to take care of one another. Contemporary Christianity has missed the mark too many times because it forgets that the Holy placed us here primarily for one thing, and that is for one another. We could have been placed here in isolation, but everything that the Holy has spoken to us reminds us of our need to look outside of ourselves you know, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there also, right? That's what Jesus tells us in the book of Acts. And so we often, often, I think, speak uh, to the needs of both the poor and the greeds of some in power. Um, 
I have two questions that I think are kind of related, so I'm going to ask you them both first. And these are the big ones. How does Unitarian Universalism approach evil? Does it recognize it? And also, is it rational to still believe the arc of the universe is bending toward justice? Does our current world situation make a mockery of this belief? All right, so evil is my favorite subject. <laughs> I actually wrote a curriculum for Unitarian Universalists on evil, and we, we will bring it here at some point. Uh, it, is, it is one of my understandings as a person of faith that we need to talk about evil. Because when we don't, we give credence to too much to just live and be a part of our society that harms us all. And so evil is one of those words that we use to point the finger at the danger, the danger that can catalyze our society and pull us into horrendous ways of being to one another and to our world. So yes, we as Unitarian Universalists are called to talk about evil, honestly. The way that our world is going, I was joking with some friends last night that Sometimes I want to learn how to do a Unitarian Universalist exorcism <laughs> because there's a whole lot that is just free and moving in our world that I wish I could just get rid of with a few beautiful words. Oh, you want to say something? I do too. Yes. This is a big question. It was two, so. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's always important to remember that, you know, in our tradition and certainly the way we practice here, we're in conversation with one another and across the ages with notions of theology where we are equipping one another to redefine these terms. You know, the English language is ours. The Bible is ours. We just need to understand it in our way, right? And so how do we have these conversations with other people of faith across all of the, the major world's religions about what is the nature of evil. And the nature of evil seems, again, to be mostly painted as being more dangerous and more severe when it is social, when it affects the greatest numbers of people. Um, folks like Walter Rauschenbusch, whose book I will teach um, later this autumn, speaks much about this. Social salvation is much more imp important and difficult, he says, than, than personal salvation, right? Um, and so, Whatever we're doing that's not honest, that isn't fair, we know what goodness is and what is obstructing goodness or what is demeaning goodness or what is destroying innocence. We're comfortable calling evil. It's not pointing to some cosmic reality with some cartoon caricature in charge but there is evil and it needs to be confronted and vanquished. I'll just quickly take the arc of the moral universe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there are times that I believe in the arc of the moral universe and other times that I feel challenged to believe in it. But what I do believe in is that we have the capacity in every moment to impact the next. And, and times have always been tough. There has always been threats to goodness. Mm -hmm. And though it feels worse in our moment, people in moments throughout history mm -hmm. despaired and wondered about goodness as well. Yeah. Next. How should those who, thanks to white privilege, have, better, have greater wealth than others best contribute and support our community? Is money the root of evil? <laughs> Oh dear. That's like four questions. <laughs> uh, so I, I will take the first part on. You okay with me taking that? Okay. So um, privilege comes in many ways. White privilege is a huge uh, challenge in our nation and in our person, if we happen to be white, that we work on by discovering what that privilege is what it has given us, and what it has taken from others. So a piece of it is education and figuring it out on ourselves rather than asking people who don't look like us to tell us. It is work that we have to do ourselves. 
because it is a burden we put on others when we are unwilling to do that work ourselves. And the second piece is then figuring out how we've caused the harm and how we can impact the blessing, the gift, the opposite of that harm. And I think that's as simple as I can say it. And the money piece, like you stated. When, unless you like dancing, we can keep dancing. <laughs> um, the, the issue with money, money, like anything, any other human invention, is a tool. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's, whether it is good or not is determined in how it is used. In money's case, which it includes how it is raised and how it is made, of course. So if it's made out of exploitation, you know, there is, there is some badness there. But the most important thing is it's a tool because we live in a, in a particular world that requires us to have that tool in order to do whatever we're doing. And so even the goodness we do requires money. So money is not inherently evil. That is, that is, it is a common reason people act in evil ways, but it is not inherently so. And by the way, we, we discovered another leak in the roof <laughs> which I'm talking about money. <laughs> and I think fixing that leak will be inherently good. <laughs> okay, can one be you, you, and still believe 100% that they are going to see their relatives in paradise after they die? You want to? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I, this is a short one. I don't know. Why not? I mean, we don't tell people what their theology is and should be. I mean, folks do their exploration and, the, and whatever the holy is or isn't for them will speak to them or not speak to them in ways they understand. And, um, you know, uh, I don't think anyone has a uh, photograph or uh, any kind of ability to examine cosmic realities um, that don't present themselves to us. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. I really nurture the uh, humility that I often see at the core of Unitarian Universalist theologies, which is the humility to know when to stop prescribing what is true. We don't know. We don't have an answer for that that can be verified. We can posit answers, and I'll do my, I almost said a bad word. I will do my best to posit those answers. It's, it's been a long time since we've been doing live worship. Um, <laughs> do my best to posit those answers. Um, however, um, there's always got to be space. You have to leave space for the reality that we don't know everything, and we can't possibly. And that space is where the mystery is and oftentimes where the beauty is. Maybe yes, maybe, maybe no. Maybe no. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know. Okay. I understand UU has a loosely held theology. Why is it not emphasized? Hmm. I think, well, we're, we're emphasizing that this morning. Um, I, I think it depends on what you, you're referring to as Unitarian Universalism. I think all of our communities are different, and we all have different flavors. I think this particular community, as I tell my, um, my, my minister colleagues, and frankly, anyone who will ask, I, I call this congregation, this people, a, a yes people, meaning... Folks here are very open. You know, I see people come up here and, and, and share all manner of things. And I never see them being told that they're wrong or that's, you know, how could you say that? They might say, I don't see it that way. Um, but the way we practice, I feel, does emphasize that. Now, on a national level, that's probably more difficult for the association at large because they're speaking to every Unitarian Universalist and every UU community, and they probably want to err on the side of non-emphasizing theology as often as maybe they could, you know, to not upset folks. You know, sometimes, sometimes folks forget this freedom and this openness, and they assume that their particular way of practicing Unitarian Universalism, whether it's in their congregation or a summer camp or whatever their group is, that that is all Unitarian Universalism is. And, and they're not always as open as we feel they could be of understanding a broader theological diversity. In fact, welcoming it and being grateful and joyful that it's come. Yeah. Just checking the time, Jenny. I think we'll just do one more. One more. Okay. Um, do you want a very personal question or a very uh, you, not not personal to you, but personal to oh. to people mm. or oh, oh, yeah. or. Uh, a very congregational question. 
Let's do the personal question because uh, oftentimes the questions we don't get to, we come back to in other, in other services. We'll okay. Personal one. If one has sinned and thought bad thoughts but wants to be a good you, you, how can I repent? Ooh. Mm. Have I shown you the blueprints for the confessional? <laughs> You thought that was a welcome desk out there. <laughs> that's actually the confessional. There's, um, so I think that's a beautiful question uh, because oftentimes we don't uh, think about re repentance and sin as part of the Unitarian Universalist theology. But as we've said, we, we need to have a broad understanding of what each of us need. We, we need to be able to include what each of us needs our, on our own spiritual journey. And there are certainly times that I've felt that I've needed to repent in a space to do that. Um, so I would say that one of the places it starts is you can have a conversation with one of us, and we can help guide you to um, discern uh, what would be appropriate repentance for you. Sometimes it's making amends to those you feel you have harmed. Sometimes it's making amends to yourself. If, if you are the, the one who has felt the brunt mm. of, of the, what you understand to be sin. Wow. That's good. Yeah, I, that, that's brilliant. I appreciate you sharing that. I, I, I want to share something that's in a different place, too. I think one of the most important things about our journey is that it needs to be integrated. So if, if, we're, if we're saying that our principle of inherent worth and dignity matters, that of you know, world community and peace, a, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, of respect for the interdependent web, in there means that responsible search for truth has got to come with a rigorous integrity, which meaning when we discover that we've done something wrong, we need to be honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And part of our repentance, because we were all made for one another, means we need to find ways to make amends somehow. We need to share that. Because at some level, the search for truth means this. The search for truth is a moral accomplishment, says Matthew Crawford. Uh, he's a, he's a, a philosopher and a motorcycle mechanic. <laughs> That's another sermon. The search for truth is a moral accomplishment because when we follow it to where it truly leads, it means that we love the truth more than we love our current understanding or the baggage we walked into that search with, right? And so if in, in our search, we, it, the truth stares us in the face, it is, I'll call it a duty to accept it and to respond to it in an intelligent and loving and healing way. And I do believe that means amends and whatever method of confession or embrace of our true selves, even in our not so good moments, might require. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to Ginny for reading the questions. Thank you all for sharing such incredible questions and know that they will be those read and those not read, you'll hear about again throughout the year uh, as, as we share our services with you. And we're going to do our closing hymn. Great.
for all that is our life. We pray that our hearts never become like walled gardens with locked gates. We hope that the questions that plague us also serve us. Mm. And that answering those questions together in joy and challenge that we work and play also to build the common good. And we hope that in time, we will be able to sing those questions together. May it, it be. And so. amen. Let us sing our chalice lighting extinguishing. I'll worship as ended. Let our service be. Welcome, those are here in person. If you would like to come forward and greet any of us who have been providing music or have been providing words for our worship, please come forward and greet with us here. And those of you who have joined us virtually, it was wonderful to share worship with you.